Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, for the organizers that uh, brought me here, I, uh, I have to say that we see uh, plots of graphs, uh, how they are connected. I feel that I am on the corner of the connections, but um, I'm working on uh, convexity and high dimensional probability. So what I'm mo uh, mostly interested in is uh, the investigation of high dimensional objects matrices, graphs, uh, polynomial systems uh, that are measures that are high dimensional, tensors also lately. So I'm running uh, in Texas A&M with JM the random tensors seminar. I'm trying to learn about tensors and communicate a little bit about the high dimensional probability. So there will be some tensors today in the talk. Uh, but not uh, tensor networks. Uh, yeah, I learned a lot this week, but not enough to tell you something about it. So um, the title of my talk it was uh, a long one, Small Ball Probabilities for Simple Random Tensors. I will try to explain all the words in, uh, in the title. And then uh, it was not a great idea, but I continued the title and Applications to Smooth Analysis for Tensor Decomposition. So I will try to say also a little bit about that. Okay, so uh, let me start with uh, the motivation. So uh, this is about uh, uh, recovering the rank one uh, components of, uh, of a tensor. So let me write the problem. So let's say that uh, uh, x1, uh, xm, these are n dimensional. It can be in different dimensions, but let's say in the, uh, uh, through my talk, let's say that uh, n dimensional. These are drawn by uh, some unknown distribution. And uh, uh, our goal is uh, we want to recover the, uh, the the rank one components by observing the sum of uh, uh, xi tensor L, let's say, and let's say that we have R of them. So let's say that's the problem. Let, I will uh, refer very often to two papers. The first one is uh, of uh, Anari Raskalakis. Mars, Papa Dimitriou, Saberi, and Vampala. This is around 2020, I think. Uh, which uh, the the title of uh, of the paper was about uh, assemblies of neurons and uh, what they wanted. It is to they have some uh, observation about when you uh, the brain sees something, then some of the neurons, uh, of course, uh, respond and uh, they give some uh, uh, weights. So the X size for them, they just live on, on some uh, uh, set of uh, neurons. They take value zero and one if they belong or not. And then they have some weights and they see this observation and they want to see the connection of the, of the neurons. So like recovering the Venn diagram. Of course, this problem has many, many applications, but on this setting, uh, everything was discrete, and uh, they wanted to solve that problem. So as we have seen, so the question is how, how to solve this problem. I, uh, someone is giving me this one, and I want to find the rank one components. Uh, of course, the answer, as we have we had many times. How many values of L are you observing? Uh, the L is how many tensors? Hmm? How many, how many, what is the order of the tensor? And yeah. R, for the moment, is not very large. And on everything that I will say, that will be exponential with respect to that, all, all the estimates. So we, they always consider this to be not very large. Like L, like three or four should usually be. No, more, but... Uh, not necessarily something that uh, goes to infinity. 
as n goes to infinity, that depends on n. <coughs> okay, so the question is how to solve this problem, and the answer is that we can't, as uh, uh, most of uh, the problems that we mentioned here, this problem is NP hard. So, uh, but there is a twist, and the question is how uh, we can make a twist in order to actually work this out. So, the first idea it is, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's consider that we have uh, uh, three you, tensors. Please, now I'm confused. So, the summation is from, what's the summation? I. One, two, R, but you have M vectors. These are n-dimensional vectors. Mm -hmm. N-dimensional vectors. Yeah, x1 to xm in the line above. It's, it's m equal oh, r. Let's back it up. Thank you. OK, sorry. Uh, OK, so how this works out. So here is the first remark. Uh, the the, the, the key uh, algorithm, here it is, uh, let's, in order to make it precise, let me first consider a three tensor, three tensors. And uh, so we have something that looks like uh, that. So I'm writing R, so let's keep it R, UI, uh, VI, WI. And uh, I want now to, this is given to me, I want you to find the components. And uh, this is, there is an algorithm with many names. So it is uh, Chang's lemma. Uh, sometimes it's called Genix lemma in the literature or simultaneous uh, decolonization. Which says that under some conditions, uh, if uh, I consider u, v, and w, the vectors that uh, I will create by the columns, by creating by columns, picking from, uh, from these guys, if uh, the rank of uh, u is uh, the rank of v is equal to r, so this is how many columns I have, and if uh, on W I have that any uh, two columns are linearly dependent, any uh, two columns of W are linearly dependent, then uh, one can write down an algorithm. There is an algorithm that uh, actually runs polynomial in time with uh, poly time that uh, recovers the unique uh, factors, the unique factors, factors of t. Okay, so starting with that, it says that we have at least some conditions that if these conditions are verified, then, uh, then at least the three version uh, of, of the problem has a solution that actually it works in polynomial time and uh, it really depends on, on linear algebra and uh, diagonalizing these two vectors by hitting by two values. It's not my point to, to, to explain that, so this thing exists. What is the, the issue? The issue is that uh, it may happen that uh, if you are uh, uh, not in this situation, then, uh, then uh, the algorithm will never uh, will never work, or if you are close to the situation that this is not satisfied, then again your algorithm will uh, will run uh, uh, with time almost to infinity. So what is the situation? We have already said the word variety. So the objects that uh, they don't satisfy this, they will be inside my big space. Now this is three, then it will be uh, three to uh, and to the L, it will be some uh, some variety, and in the case that you will uh, you will start with something that lives there, then uh, your algorithm will never work. So what is the what is the point? The point is that uh, instead of uh, working with uh, this one, 
we will work with uh, a noisy version, or if you want uh, the smooth analysis of the problem. So what is that? Let's say that instead of having the, let's say the U1, or let me go back here, instead of having the X1, XR, let's say that I have X1 tilde, XR tilde, which are the, the XR plus some uh, random variable, let's call it YR. Okay, so I have some random noise. In the case that I have some random noise, then uh, what will happen? Then everything is fuzzy, is noisy, so even if I will be here, then there will be some probability that I will, f uh, I will go away. So now, why is the, y is, the Ys are small. Oh, if it is, no, it's the other way around. If, there are, if they go to zero, then uh, there may be a chance that my algorithm will fail. So I need my noise to be significantly enough, even if it sounds a little bit strange, in order to guarantee that my algorithm will work. But your noise can be arbitrarily small, and it'll make those ranks. I, I haven't said. I haven't said how I will compare them yet. But I'm saying that if I will add some noise, then I have some chance to have an algorithm that will work in every case. Okay, that's a smooth analysis. Yes, but I, I okay. So, I and typical that's the situation. Typically, I will have some measurement that they will be noisy, so that's fine. Now, so now the problem is what, how big should be the noise in order to guarantee that things will work, and how this will implement it on the running time of my algorithm. Okay, so this is what uh, 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 this this paper that worked this. This is the situation that they work and they they managed to do it. They uh, work, they build on a paper of uh, Bascara, <coughs> sorry, Carr, Moitra, Isaiah, Raga, Van. I hope that I spell it correctly. <coughs> uh, which uh, is called Smooth Analysis on Tensor Decomposition, which actually uh, says is saying ex they do exactly what I just said. They they put the, the they investigate the problem. How big must be the noise in order to guarantee that my algorithm will work? Now there is a, there is a, a first issue that first of all this algorithm works for three tensors. So the next thing to do it is uh, if I will start with uh, my sum of uh, uh, x. Uh, how I'm writing it. Let me write for five. So let's say that I have a one, a two, a three, a i. Sorry, this is the i that goes to r, and then I have three, four, and five. What they propose is that I will group these guys. Uh, just, just so, so here I thought sort of the x, so the standard product would be the identical, te uh, identical vectors. Yeah. Xi times xi times xi. But now you have different ones, or? So this is, this is my initial problem. Now, they, we make the first twist on the problem. We say that so our. Is not because of the noise, or? On this size, from now on, it will be replaced by this size. So all my measurements are noisy. And now I want to solve this problem. Given that the xi is of the tilde. So, so the a, ai. Now ai is, let's say that I have five guys. And, and they are different only in their noise, or, or it's already like the xr, xi component different? Uh, I just want to make a group here. So it is. Uh, uh, I, want, he's I want to say. It's a symmetric realm. I want to. No longer assuming symmetric tensor. Yeah, they're not symmetric. Okay. No, what I'm going to say is that. Uh, there are some uh, manipulations still I will arrive to the problem. So uh, what they do, uh, this algorithm was for three tensors. But my initial problem it is for an arbitrary num uh, number. So what, I'm gonna, what they're going to do, it is that if I have five, they will group this one to one, this one to two, to another one, and this one to the third one. So this will create the, the, 
uh, a Kati Katirao pro, uh, uh, product. This one again, and then this one again. So this now uh, what uh, what I'm going to do? I'm going to increase the dimension, and uh, I'm going to reduce the L to three in this way. This is what they do. Now this uh, requires some work, but uh, it can be done. Uh, and then uh, what we need? What is the the next thing that we need, they need to guarantee that these conditions are satisfied. But these conditions are, uh, we want a quantified version of these conditions. This says, let's say that uh, this is the smallest singular value is positive. But this is not enough. They want the smallest singular value to be at least something in order to guarantee that the things will work. So uh, they, what, uh, what, they, what they do at the very end after after some work, it's they say the following. Assume, they do the grouping, and uh, they say the following. Uh, let start with the T. I start it, I write it as, uh, let me write it again. Let me put the tildes. And then uh, I will create, and uh, create, the matrix says that has as columns the flattening vectors of the x size. If I can guarantee, so this is the uh, uh, x1 tensor product as a vector, and this, uh, 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 this is the xr. Okay? So this is a matrix. And uh, they say that if, uh, if uh, I know, if I know that the smallest singular value of the matrix A is at least something, then, uh, let me write it here, then uh, there exists an algorithm. that runs in polynomial time uh, polynomial also with respect to the something to one over the something and uh, uh, and uh, the the dimension of the space so what they say is that my initial problem if i have a noisy vector if, I will, if my noise will be enough to guarantee that the smallest singular value will be something with at least some probability, on this event, I have a, uh, an algorithm that runs in polynomial time. So you want to put the x tilde there? Is this what you say? I put this tilde. So these are random. So I have some fixed guys that I, I don't know. I make a random perturbation. I create a matrix in this way. I want to guarantee that it is, uh, has small singular value. The smallest singular value is at least something. And then they say that based on these algor algorithms, then there is a, 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 an algorithm that they will find all the components. Of course, this algorithm will run with high probability, and the probability will be the probability that I know this event. OK? Questions? So the tensor decomposition has the existence of this decomposition and even its uniqueness has nothing to do with the metric structure. No. So the, the theoretical, I'm not saying the algorithm, yeah. I'm saying the theoretical existence of this decomposition uh, to sum of R rank one elements is independent of metric. Okay. So, so say you, you, you you, you have bad luck with your singular values, as long as they're not exactly zero, you just change the metric and uh, make them better. But, okay, I think the point that they have is that as long my noise is big enough, at least something, then I will have this with high probability, so we know, I will know with high probability that I have an algorithm that works. That's it. Okay, and <clears throat> in polynomial time, with respect to with respect to everything. Okay. I guess that's the point.
yeah, and and uh, given that you can prove that, okay. Now, I still haven't arrived to the point. What are the small ball probabilities? At least that that's the motivation. But uh, now let's think a little bit about the smaller singular value here. What I have, I have a, I have a matrix. I need to in order to show that uh, the uh, smaller singular value is at least non-zero. Then I need to show that the distance, let's say, of let's let's let me say a one a r of a i with respect to the span of uh, the a j with j different than i to be positive. You agree that's uh, that's a uh, that's a way to say that this guy will be invertible. So uh, what is that now? I have uh, this is a this is a random tensor, and I want the distance from the span of the rest of the tensor. So what I actually need to do, I need to find, I need to show that uh, my projection of uh, my random tensor on a subspace. Uh, well, this subspace is the perp of the rest, the probability to be small is small. If I will prove that, then I will show that at least that this one is far away from the span of the rest because they're independent, if my, if my nodes are independent. And then if I will do it for all of them, then there is a method by this in order to arrive to the smallest singular value. Yes, please. Just minor confusion. So your x, xi's are already drawn from a random distribution. So why do you need sort of another level of randomness? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Yeah, I mean, you, you've brought the x, the x1 to xr. They are already from a random distribution. xr are fixed. But I don't know. And y r are random. So these are deterministic. That's my initial guys. And now this is the noise. Maybe that was the confusion. So it was drawn by unknown distribution? Or? So this are, this, that was my, my initial guys, but this may be de deterministic. Okay. This may be deterministic. Initially, I have some samples, but these are perhaps are the neurons that I want, to, uh, I want to understand. And then I have some noise because of my measurements. Okay, I, I, I've done the experiment and these are noisy. <clears throat> so what I can, I can control this, this I don't know anything. Okay, so... For example, on this, uh, on this setting, because it was discrete, these are discrete noise, they, because uh, these guys, they wanted to do uh, uh, learning of uh, mixtures of Gaussian, it was, uh, they were Gaussian, etc. So I have some randomness that it decided that I, th I consider it as noise, and this I want to control how big is this in order to my uh, algorithm to work. Okay, so at least I arrived to my first goal. So my, my problem is to understand what is the probability that uh, if I will take my random tensor, which is a perturbation around my, uh, something fixed, and uh, project it on a subspace, so now the dimension of my subspace will be m. And uh, I want the, the norm of this to, uh, the probability that the norm of this to be small to be small. But this means that the probability to be on a small ball is small. That's, that's why these are called small ball probabilities. Okay, now this also kind of makes sense for my initial problem because what I want, I want my distribution to be enough well spread, to don't be around some, some uh, point. Uh, if, because I want to avoid some bad situation, which is rare, but I want to avoid it. So I want to put some randomness that it is enough spread in order to guarantee that I will stay away from my bad situation. This is here, it happens for tensor, but this is very generic in all this uh, smooth analysis problem. There is some bad situation, which is rare, but may happen, and you want to create an algorithm that it will avoid this situation, and the smooth analysis, that the randomness has to make it work. Now, but these are small, these are a strange inequality. It's not a mark of inequality, which is the usual way to prove, uh, to prove inequality. So how to prove such an inequality? So let me say, first of all, what uh, these guys did. These guys were working for Gaussian, with Gaussian. So what is the situation here? 
it is that uh, you have uh, some Gaussians with some fixed mean and variance, and you take the tensor, and then you project, and you want to compute this probability. Sounds easy, but it actually it's a quite difficult problem because you have tensors, so you, you go immediately to polynomials. So the estimate that they proved uh, was Okay, so they proved, so this is the Pascara and all. They proved that as long R is less than N to the L over two, uh, then uh, the smallest singular value, the S mean on this situation is of order of uh, N over rho to the three to the L. Uh, so the opposite, rho over n to the 3 to the L with uh, probability at least 1 minus e to minus n to 1 over 3 to the L. Sorry. And rho is the variance of my Gaussians that I started with. Okay? So you need... Uh... So the smallest singular value is something very small, okay? That's why L, if you, this is, uh, goes double exponential with respect to L that you ask initially. Okay, so if L is uh, 50, you're terrible. Okay, even in the Gaussian case. So what is... This is, kind of, this is bad news. Huh? This, this result is bad news, right? This is what they was able to prove, even in the Gaussian case, for this problem. But you want the smallest singular value to be large, and that's a small number. You want uh, right? They prove that they can prove that it is at least that, uh -huh. with with uh, some probability. And is that good enough? Is my question. For L, very small is good because it's it's, it's still polynomial. If L is five, it's n to the three to the five on your on your estimate. Is if L is fifty, it's terrible. Now uh, these guys they 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 work very differently, and they proved so the Anari and all. They had a very different uh, approach to this problem. What they did, they, do, they did Gaussian elimination for tensors, and I don't know if this is related to the subrank that we were talking yesterday, but uh, that, this is what they propose. And uh, the estimate that they proved, it is that the probability that the smallest singular value of A to be less than epsilon over L to the L is less than N to the 2L, epsilon to the 1 uh, plus a constant times n. That was the estimate that they proved. As, uh, as, uh, as long they have some uh, distribution, so uh, the entries uh, in uh, uh, the randomness y, so the y r i satisfy some uh, small ball probability, so the probability that what uh, i minus z to be less than epsilon, less than epsilon over all z. So most uh, distributions they will satisfy something like that. So it is very general. It's a little bit better. It's better than what the other guys did. And uh, then there were also different efforts from several people, so I guess I can erase that. It's okay to erase this. <coughs> In order to give answer to this small ball probability, uh, so how to attack this problem? One way to prove small ball probability is uh, 
uh, via concentration of measure. So what is concentration of measure? So concentration of measure is a general phenomenon in high dimension that says that if I have a function f, let's say from a range to r, that uh, let's say it is one Lipschitz, and uh, let's say that x is Gaussian, it is true for many distributions, then if, uh, if it is one lips, it says, it says that the metric fluctuations are, are, are uh, well balanced, then it says that also the, the, uh, the probabilistic, the measure theoretic fluctuations are also balanced. So this says that my function is very probable that it will concentrate, well, C is a universal constant. It will concentrate around its mean. Okay, that's the concentration of measure. So this is a very powerful tool. Lisa also was talking uh, about this uh, the other day. Now, one of the aspects it is that it will tell you also something about small ball probabilities. Because if I know that the expectation of this object it is something, then uh, this will say that the probability, the one side inequality will say that the probability that f will be less than the expectation minus something is at least small. So it is, a, it is a tool. This is very well developed. And, uh, uh, but we need this for tensor. It will give you something, but that's the wrong way, actually, to prove small ball probabilities, but it will give you something. So in 2020, in 2020, Versinin proved the following, that if I have uh, tensors, so I prove a, this type of result for tensors. And then there is a, another paper of uh, Bamberger, Kramer, and Russell Ward, which says the following, that uh, if I have uh, f from r n to the l to the r, that it is convex and Lipschitz. Let's say one Lipschitz. That's a normalization. And if x is, let me write it bold, uh, x1 xl is a simple tensor, a simple random tensor. Then uh, I have an estimate of this type. However, the estimate here is uh, minus c to the t squared over l n to the l minus 1. And uh, there are some assumptions. So for example, it works for Gaussian. It works also for more general distributions, but I prefer to move on. I can tell you the details later on. Now, again, you can plug in this estimate. This will give you something uh, about this problem. And there's a smaller singular value. And uh, again, it will be something very different than what you see here, something very different than what these guys are proving with very different method. Again, there are some uh, uh, regimes of n, l, and epsilon that one beats the other. But all this says that we just don't know how to deal with this problem. OK, so any questions? So how, how should we be reading the, these? these concentration inequalities. I understand. Because what, what I don't understand is how good, of an, how good of an estimate we need to prove the kind of things you want to prove. Yeah. A concentration here, it says that my function, except uh, some, uh, let's throw this, take t100 yeah. and throw it away. Then it says that my function is practically constant. It's, my, it's like expectation plus something. So if it is constant, then of course it satisfies whatever I want. So concentration inequality says that if I will throw away some probability, high dimensional objects behave like constant. Right, right. so how does this, now is that helping? How is that helping us solve the original question? Yes, it says that with, uh, with high probability, I will. I will be away from, uh, from a bad, yes. 
Because you see, this is a situation. You have some variety. It's a very rare thing, but you may fall on it. Now, if I know that I have at least some way that I will go away, then I know that my algorithm will work. That's the idea of the smooth analysis. OK, so my, the, the so point, the point here is, the is expectation. The expecta if you hit the expectation, yeah, I know exactly, that the expectation of this guy, if, if I have Gaussians, I know that the expectation of this guy is square root of m, for example. And so if you hit the expectation, then you know you're safe. Yeah, exactly. I know that I have moved enough, oh, enough away. OK? But how, how well I'm concentrated? How do you know that you didn't end up on another pathological manifold? I, I have a pathological thing at oh, that. Yeah, but, 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 like, okay, but, what I'm saying is, okay, if, if this random noise brings you always basically to the same tensor in some sense, right, in high dimensional space? Yes. Maybe you end up on another pathological manifold? Exactly, exactly. So it is possible, as you say, I, I, I'm, I don't know anything about the geometry. So I have to guarantee that I will stay really far away for tensors. So this is the problem. That's why this, what I wrote of uh, Vercinin, is helpful, because it tells me something about a random tensor. I take a random tensor, and then I take my function. It can be any convex. Take just the projection and Euclidean norm. And then it tells me something about how this object Oh, behaves. and you take your function the distance to the bad locus? Is that? My function that I will pick, it will be projection and then Euclidean norm. For this one. Oh, oh OK. So the okay. function is measuring the failure of your hypothesis to exactly. be satisfied. Yeah. For example, let me go back to my problem. Any more questions? <laughs> more questions? Good, OK. <clears throat> uh, but, but you're right. This is general problem doesn't tell you anything. This one, because it is tailored for tensors, is telling you something. Good. So I want to, let me say a little bit about what we did with, uh, I mentioned that this is a joint work with uh, my students, Johan. And uh, so the first thing that we did is an idea from geometry, so symmetrization. OK, uh, we want to say that we have a distribution and it is enough well spread. So let me just, uh, let's say that I have some, let's draw a one dimensional version. Let's say that we work X with densities. Okay, and let's say that this is my density. Now, this is, if I, if I have a lot of behavior like that, then it is a well spread. So if I will do a procedure to just Let's say that I will put here my, my value that I want to, to, to concentrate. And if I will take as blocks and put all the blocks in a decreasing order, then uh, I will create something that it is like that. So if it, it is f, then this is f star. Now, if uh, the f star, it is less well spread than this object. Oh. I want, on the picture that I had, we had the variety, right? And I put some distribution here. As more spread is my distribution, is better is for me. You agree? Yeah. So as, as far away I'm giving probability, as better is for me. OK, so now I have a density. This is where I, where I put probability. As far as I'm giving probability away from the, my point, is better for me. So if I will symmetrize, I will make things more difficult, OK? So I, if I will put it in a decreasing order. And if I will say that I work with densities, bounded densities, and let's say that the infinity norm is 1, then among all densities that are of this type, the worst one will be to be just constant, OK? Let me make precise now what is well spread. Can you just repeat that? The worst one will be what? I, I, among all decreasing densities, if you have that the mass is preserved, and I'm telling you that you have to keep this point, and tell you just to put it as close to zero, what one you will choose? You will not choose this one? OK. Let me make this precise. Okay. So if I have a density, 
let's say in Iran, and let's say that x is distributed with respect to this density, and then, uh, and let's say that I have another one that is distributed with respect to another density. I say that x is less, is stochastic dominated by y, if uh, the probability that x lies on a k is always less, this I explained, I think, than the probability that y lies in k for all k symmetric and complex. So that's a standard notion to say that uh, uh, a density is less big than another one because to test that for all symmetric and convex sets, so around zero, this probability will be less than that probability, okay? Good, so this is a way to measure things. <coughs> and uh, say that things are more peaked and uh, What uh, is the theorem? Because I think I will be completely out of time. The theorem that we proved is the following. Let's say that I have x1, uh, xm, independent random vectors. And uh, all of them, they have independent coordinates. That was also the situation until now. And uh, I have that all of them, they have densities with densities that are bounded. And just a normalization, let's say, that are bounded by one. So now I take the random tensor. So these are in Rn. In Rn. <coughs> I said. And then I take the random tensor. This is less dominated by the stars, where the stars are the ones that are symmetrized. What this says, it says that if I will symmetrize my random vectors, then the tensors will have this property, which means that if I will test them in every convex body, the probability will be less if I will take the symmetric ones. And if I have the symmetric ones, among all the symmetric ones, the, the worst ones are the ones that are, uh, 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 are created by the uniform on uh, minus one half, one half. <coughs> so if uh, I also write Z1, ZL that are independent and uniform on uh, the discrete cubes, then uh, this one, is the worst case scenario. Why are you storing the Z? I don't need star on the Z, you're right. Because they're already symmetrized. So this says that on my problem, and actually not only for the Euclidean norm, but for whatever norm you want, the worst case scenario, it is to consider the uniform measure on minus one ones in all coordinates. That was great initially, but uh, doesn't mean that I know how to compute also this one. It says immediately, so as a corollary, we have that the probability, the small ball probability that we want to compute under these assumptions, so to L less than epsilon is less than the probability if I will consider on uh, uniform on the cubes. So I have reduced this problem to that problem, but still this is uh, difficult. Also, the Bhaskara and all, they had Gaussians and still it was a complicated problem. So the next step, how much time I have? Five minutes? Okay. So the next problem was to work with low concave measures. So I don't know how to compute this one uh, explicitly. So we had developed a, a method that works for all log concave measures. So now log concave measures. But actually they have some nice properties. So what are log concave measures? X, a random vector in Rn. Uh, if it has a density, 
is distributed with respect to a density that it is of this form, where V is uh, convex, then uh, this is called a low-concave vector, and the measure is called a low-concave measure. And uh, V may take also uh, the infinity. So examples are, of course, the Gaussian, of course, the exponentials, but also the uniform measures on convex sets. So that's a quite rich family. And uh, there was a technique that's called localization that was popularized by Kanan Lovas and Simonovic. Uh, and uh, this is what they use, Carberry and Wright, and uh, Olivier Guedon, and later on, uh, Nazarov and Sodin. And uh, in order to prove small ball probabilities for seminomes, on low concave measures. So we use these results. And so I don't know how to compute this for the cube, but I actually compute it for all low concave measures. Sometimes it's better to go to something more general. And uh, the theorem is the following. The theorem is that uh, if uh, uh, x1 or xn are independent vectors in Rn, low concave. And I have to normalize. Now the normalization will be a little bit different. It is that uh, the covariance is the identity. Then uh, the probability of the PF of the tensor of the Xi's to be less than epsilon square root of m. Square root of m is an expectation, so that's the right way. This is less than uh, c over c to the l over l minus 1 factorial. And then there is an epsilon, and then there is a log e over epsilon to the l minus 1. So, so this is what we proved. And then uh, if you combine uh, the two results, then it says that uh, if I have uh, anything with density that has bounded densities, then uh, this probability, because it's less than uh, the probability on, uh, on, uh, uh, on the cubes, and the cubes, they fall in this category, they satisfy this equation, this, uh, this, uh, this estimate. So this is our, if you combine these two, this is our main result. And then uh, we actually checked that this is sharp. So, <clears throat> so there is a computation. Uh, if I will take, let's say, Z to be the tensor of Z dice, uh, for every M, there exists a subspace F, the dimension of F equals M, such that the probability of PF of tensor ZI less than epsilon square root of M is bigger or equal. I think it is the same thing, but with one logarithm off. So what's the L minus 2 or something like that? I think. So up to, uh, this is for M up to N. Above, above that, I don't know an example, which says that this estimate turns out to be pretty, pretty sharp. And then there was uh, another surprise to me. So, so, so M is the dimensionality of the vectors? M is the, M is the dimension of my substance. So for every L, I have for every N, and for every L, and for every M, up to N, I can find a subspace so that it will satisfy this. So this is for every n l m. 
Yeah, so I get, so L is the number of factors you have in the tensor product. Yes, right? on the tensors. Uh, M is the dimension of the subspace that I'm projecting. Uh -huh. On my huge space of tensors. Here M is N and minus epsilon one, is right? anything on zero one. But here M is n minus one, right? Is what you want. Uh, here I have L minus. There is a oh no. Because you're projecting. I think you're projecting onto the span of the others. For my application, yeah. but in general, I'm thinking about the problem for every subspace. Okay. Now, why this fits okay with my application? It is because. Since on my problem, I have one column and it's independent of the rest, the, the rest I can condition. So if I have an estimate for any subspace, this will work in order to prove something about... Yeah, so it, I'm not working about a specific subspace, because I don't know what, so this is just a random object. I'm working for every subspace. The, now, that's, that's my last remark, because I guess I will be out of time. Huh? I, I got it now. Okay, so... So this, this looks sharp, at least uh, on that one. And then we try to compute what is happening. So we can find a subspace that's a very particular one. What is happening for a generic subspace? So if, uh, if I will take the Grassmannian, so this is the Grassmannian, and then uh, I consider a random subspace, then uh, I get something very different. Not for the ZIs, for whatever. Uh, C epsilon to the minimum of M and N. So we get something like that. That means that a generic subspace, this also with very high probability with respect to the Grassmannian, with respect to the Haar measure. So this says that the generic subspace have way better small board probabilities than this one, but there are some specific guys that they have this behavior and this can be achieved. So then uh, I think I'm out of time, but that was actually the bottleneck of all the, this paper. So if you have some estimate, then you plug it in back and you get uh, some improvements on the smaller sigma value and all the running algorithm and all that stuff. And I think I'm out of time, I will stop here, thank you.